to me, what we want to do is we want to see that adjustment hasn't worked either. That all the things we've done in our life to adjust and to make it better, none of them have worked. And he's talking about the two, he talked earlier about the two emotions, and I think if we pick it up, um, maybe the third paragraph. The one emotion in which substitution is impossible is love. Fear involves substitution by definition, for it is love's replacement. Fear is both a fragmented and fragmenting emotion. It seems to take many forms, and each one seems to require a different form of acting out for satisfaction. While this appears to introduce quite variable behavior, a far more serious effect lies in the fragmented perception from which the behavior stems. No one is seen complete. The body is emphasized with special emphasis on certain parts and used as the standard for comparison of acceptance or rejection, for acting out a special form of fear. So that, that even starts to raise a little bit with our last night after our video gathering we were talking about how if the body is either attractive or is repulsive based on physical characteristics, you know, when the body is emphasized. And, you know, you could apply that to um, many, many different things. I would say probably the common thing is dating, relationships, you know, this whole thing of, you know, bachelorette number one, you know. But you describe yourself. <laughs> Sometimes it has to do with a lot with the physical and and all this stuff about even dating. You know, well, they make such a good couple. They they're both attractive, or or they're both unattractive, and they they match up well. <laughs> you know, it's there's always an emphasis on on the body and on the physical, and that it just goes into things really deeply with that one. But now here's where he's going to begin describing the, the original problem, the, the fall. He says, You who believe that God is fear made but one substitution. It has taken many forms because it was the substitution of illusion for truth, of fragmentation for wholeness. It has become so splintered and subdivided and divided again over and over that it is now almost impossible to perceive it once was one, and still is what it was. That one error, which brought truth to illusion, infinity to time, and life to death, was all you ever made. Your whole world rests upon it. Everything you see reflects it, and every special relationship that you have ever made is part of it. You may be surprised to hear how very different is reality from what you see. You do not realize the magnitude of that one error. It was so vast and so completely incredible that from it a world of total unreality had to emerge. What else could come of it? Its fragmented aspects are fearful enough as you begin to look at them, but nothing you have seen begins to show you the enormity of the original error which seemed to cast you out of heaven to shatter knowledge into meaningless bits of disunited perceptions and to force you to make further substitutions. That was the first projection of error outward. The world arose to hide it and became the screen on which it was projected and drawn between you and the truth. So there's the screen that we talk about all the time. You know, the problem's not on the screen. And the, the screen arose, the, the guilt was hurled out onto the screen. So the screen is like supposed to take all this guilt and it's supposed to then seem like it's the cause or it's the source of all the problems. And the screen is not the problem. The screen was made to hide the ego. So everything we talked about is going to be coming back to tracing it back so we can get back to the ego and, and unveil it. See it. For truth extends inward where the idea of loss is meaningless and only increase is conceivable. 
Do you really think it's strange that a world in which everything is backwards and upside down arose from this projection of error? For truth brought to this could only remain within and quiet and take no part in all the mad projection by which this world was made. Call it not sin, but madness, for such it was, and so it still remains. Invest it not with guilt, for guilt implies it was accomplished in reality. And above all, be not afraid of it. When you seem to see some twisted form of the original error rising to frighten you, say only, God is not fear, but love, and it will disappear. The truth will save you. It has not left you to go out into the mad world and so depart from you. Inward is sanity. Insanity is outside you. You but believe it is the other way around, that truth is outside and error and guilt within. Your little senseless substitutions, touched with insanity and swirling lightly off on a mad course, like feathers dancing insanely in the wind, have no substance. They fuse and merge and separate in shifting and totally meaningless patterns that need not be judged at all. To judge them individually is pointless. Their tiny differences in form are no real differences at all. None of them matters. That they have in common, and nothing else. And then the next conjunction, the next paragraph is, Let them all go, dancing in the wind, dipping and turning, till they disappear from sight, far, far outside me, and turn you to the stately calm within, where in holy stillness dwells the living God you never left, and who never left you. Now this is another way of looking at all these images that we've been talking about, is these, like these little, like feathers, that, that if you can just, if you step back and you see the world as a swirl of feathers, or a swirl of images, I mean that's the mystic state in a sense, that's a real detachment, but it's like going, or uh, Mary and I came across all these ants the other day, a, a, a bunch of ants just going like this on the sidewalk. And as you step back, they're kind of like the swirling feathers. They're just mm -hmm. weaving and weaving and weaving and weaving. You, you don't try to pick out, you know, and who are the leading ants and who are the hard workers and who are the dominant ants and who are the submissive ants. And I mean, this is what this world is, is analyzing, breaking it apart. It's just a swirl and you can really stand up straight and look and see the swirl. But it's from getting down down there, so to speak, at the level of the world, and breaking it apart, and not seeing it as the swirl of feathers, but seeing it as, um, these are real people around me, this is real murder that's going on, this is real crime, this is real sickness, this is real um, pleasure, this is real uh, good stuff, you know, all the good things in life, you know, it's, it's that breaking it apart, and making it more than the swirl, that's investing it with guilt. Mm -hmm. Because you can't see that it's just a swirl and they're all equally just a bunch of feathers. Some of these feathers seem to be <laughs> important <laughs> than other of these feathers. You know, this feather he seems to spend lots of those green paper strips <laughs> on this feather, not on this. 49 cents or <laughs> something <laughs> on this feather. You know, it's, it's, they just don't seem to be the same. And it seems like you spend a lot more time with some feathers mm -hmm. yeah. than you do with mm -hmm. other feathers. Yes. Mm -hmm. Today when I was sitting out on the porch and even when I was walking around the neighborhood and seeing cars come and go and people go in their houses and come out, and you know, it was like I had that same feeling of like, well, pull it way back like you're in an airplane watching this, you know, it's like, like the ants, it was like, when you look at the ants, it, it seems like they have very purposeful movement. Mm -hmm. I was watching ants the other day too, and it was like, wow, they really act like they know exactly what they're doing, and exactly where they're going, and why they're doing it, and you know, and it's not like not they... they're not purposeful, they're not analyzing. They don't take a few steps and stop, and take a few more and <laughs> stop. I mean, they just go. Going. <laughs> you know? yeah. And I was thinking, well, 
you know, it looks like these people all moving around seem mm -hmm. to have like this purposeful movement. They get in their car and they go and they drive and they mm -hmm. go here and they go there and mm -hmm. do this and do that. And I'm thinking, this is no different. It's like just pulling it way back and thinking, oh, there's, you know, I'm, I'm looking at these people thinking, oh, there's all these separate people living in their separate houses, living their separate lives with their separate families and their separate jobs and their separate problems and it's like no no <laughs> pull it way back you know you know as you were talking I would I, I like to sort of draw so I've got my original God just being one and then all of a sudden just one line which is the split you know and then another line and just lines and then pretty soon boxes and then pretty soon little boxes and pretty soon little circles and it's like we're getting farther and farther away from God and so we said, now we need to find some substitutions. Now, we, what do we have here? We have this mess that we created, so we have to find some substitutions for God. God's so far away. God's so far away, and look what we've done, how guilty. And then there's fear. So, well, let's find something pleasurable so we can stand this insanity. So we build in now all these other fun things and things to spend money on. It. Hot air balloons, watching the Grand Canyon from hot air balloons. You know, fun things, and 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 then whiskey and wine and parties and you know wonderful careers. And let's keep now. Wait a minute. Now this isn't so bad. Let's keep hiding from truth, um, because especially now, because we're not even worthy of getting back to God. Now, so now God becomes fear, punishing, judgmental. I'm guilty. I'm fearful, which makes us feel like we're fearful, punishable, and judged. Or we can project out fear, punishment, or judgment on other people. So it's like this big old mess. But here's Holy Spirit just quietly along the side taking the arrow back to God saying, forget all that. You can actually even deny all that. Use that defense mechanism of denial and just come back to God because I'm here. Because it's such a mess, you can never understand it. You don't know what this is all about. The only thing... You know, let me know for you is what I'm seeing it as. Back to okay. that, I don't know. Yeah, even the denial, it's important to be real specific mm -hmm. about yeah. that because right. the world's, the ego's use of denial would be to not deny the screen. Right. In other words, here we are talking about this as a feather, you know, just like mm -hmm. a feather like this is a feather. But Jesus says, you're so invested in the body that the denial of the body is <coughs> inappropriate use of denial. Mm -hmm. He says, there is an appropriate use of denial, and that's to deny the belief that error right. can hurt you. So again, you see how the denial is aimed. Deny the belief that error can hurt you. Don't don't go out there and you know start reading your course and going around to hospitals and, and saying, you know, you're you're not a body, you're not sick, you're not sick and so on and so forth. I'm not, or get into a discussion with somebody, I'm not here, you're not here, we're not having this conversation. You know, that's sometimes, that would be a good example of a, of a defense. <clears throat> Trying to deny the projection, when Jesus is saying, deny the belief that error can hurt you, which is what we were getting into last night, even though some situations may initially be perceived as threatening, you can bring, quickly bring it back and choose with the Holy Spirit. Choose your right mind, choose a miracle, and deny the belief that that error can hurt you. That's an important one. The miracle, or the right mind, just sees the false as false. It doesn't arrange the images. It doesn't try to distinguish between the images. It sees the whole tree. Trunk, branches, false. No distinction between it. And that's where the release comes in. It doesn't break it apart. It doesn't break apart the ego. It sees that illusions are one as well. Mind is one. If mind is one and illusions are one, then wrong mind is one. It's not, it's not fragmented. All these uh, constructions of private minds, of time and space, all of that is just the wrong mind. And the only thing that can see that is the right mind. The right mind. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Nothing but that. Anything that would try to to figure it out 
kind of from within the wrong mind would have to just be the wrong